Hello everyone. I am M. Tamsil Shams, working as an associate staff engineer for Samsung Semiconductor India. Today I will be talking about the topic uh, coating Zephyr OS for SOC and we will look into specifically the examples of Cortex R5. So let's get started. So this is the agenda for today. So first uh, we will see what is Zephyr OS. And then we will see the different porting components which we need to actually add so as to make it uh, uh, compatible for SOC. Then we will see to how to uh, have those implementations which will support the hardware. Uh, then moving forward, we will see if, uh, the debugging tips. Then we will see the key tools and build commands. And then further, we will see the timer and the UART drivers. And then at the last, we'll see what other things we can add in the future. So basically, uh, Zephyr OS is a small time, uh, real time operating system, which is for connected resource constrained embedded devices. And it's kind of a small scale kernel, which supports uh, simple embedded devices. Uh, it has a lot of features similar to Linux kernel, like uh, memory management, uh, multi-threading, scheduler, interrupt handling, and et cetera. Uh, it supports wide varieties of uh, CPU architectures and it has a build system called West, which makes it easy to compile a lot of modules with the uh, user applica applications. And then it provides uh, SDK, which contains tool chains for different architecture. Mm -hmm. So uh, regarding the porting components, uh, basically we will see the key folder changes related to Zephyr, how when we are adding a new project or an SOC. So basically these are four uh, main things. So we will be adding a new SOC. We need to add a new board details. We need to add new drivers if needed. Like there are some basic drivers already there, but if you want to have some drivers support is not there, then you need to add those drivers. And at the end, uh, adding a device tree. So to give the resources, we need to add device tree. So this is the configuration hierarchy of Zephyr. First there is board, SOC. So it starts from bottom architecture, CPU, SOC, family series, and then the board. Yeah, so about the hardware support implementation. So if you see the same as in the previous slide, we can see there is architecture, then there is a CPU core, then there is a SOC family, then there is a SOC series, SOC drivers and boards. So taking into example of Cortex R5, if you see, uh, the architecture is ARM, uh, the CPU core is Cortex R5, SOC family will be like company name slash SOC name, whatever you are trying to, uh, the board which you're using that, like if you have for Samsung, it's Samsung underscore XYZ if you name that SOC. The SOC series is CR5 and the SOC is CR5. The drivers, basic drivers like serial, timer, interrupt, etc. And the board is Samsung board. So that can be like, these can be actually based on what one wants to name, it can be done actually. Yeah. yeah, so going into the details of each hardware configuration. So architecture as we like, whatever architecture we are using, like if it's an ARM, ARC, POS6, RISC-V, x86, whatever be the thing. Then the CPU core. So basically CPU core is what uh, implements the early boot sequence. It does all the handling related to interrupt and error, all the uh, thread context switching, and all the basic things which are done from the processor that is all done by the CPU core. So the CPU cores are like uh, ARC V2, Cortex M0 Plus, Cortex R5, those things. Then there is SOC family. Uh, it basically represents a single SOC type and it can have many of its variations depending on the peripherals and the features we are using. So it can be like uh, Kinetics, IMX, NRF or Exynos, etc. Uh, then the SOC series. So SOC series uh, represents a uh, specific uh, uh, SOC having a peripheral or feature. It's, uh, it's a subset of a SOC family actually. Uh, it can be like different Exynos, which we have like Exynos 5433 or 5850 or even Snapdragon, specific Snapdragons. Then the next thing is uh, SOC. So this is the actual SOC that is uh, soldered in the hardware platform and its configuration, which is used. So that is a like very technical to all the SOC companies. Then there is drivers. Uh, 
it's basically include device model responsible for configuring and initializing drivers. So whatever drivers we are using uh, to uh, make use of our device, that is what is driver like interrupt controller, timer, serial communication, etc. And the last thing is board, uh, which includes SOC plus its associated peripherals and features, including uh, external components also, not just the, what is present uh, on the SOC and its peripheral, but also the external components also. Uh, then the like, uh, how do we configure, how do we uh, give the details of configuration to the hardware, uh, to the Zephyr OS. So, so basically top level hardware configurations are defined by a K config, similar to how we do in kernel. And once we add that and after the build, we can see the processing results at the following locations, actually that build inside that board name will be there, Zephyr and dot config and in the include generated auto conf .h. And similarly, the low level hardware specific configurations are passed on by the device tree and the final processing results located are in these files actually. So these are generated once the Zephyr OS is built, uh, compiled for that specific SOC or board. So these are two different ways of uh, configuring the top level hardware and low level hardware configurations. So now we will look into uh, how, what all changes we need to make to add a new SOC. So we need to define the SOC family, uh, the SOC series, the SOC and the SOC part number. So if you see, we have already talked about architecture, CPU core. Now this is the main part where we are adding the SOC basically. The SOC related files are located at this location, SOC, then the architecture name, SOC family name and the SOC series. So if you see for CR5, whatever we have uh, discussed earlier, will be like CO, SOC, ARM, Samsung, XYZ, and then CR5, and then all the files related to it. So all the SOC folders actually have basic information like the processor information, IRQ controller, linkers, or any, any SOC related init configuration, which will be, we will be doing. And it is called as part of the system and isolation with priority zero. So this is the first, uh, first, first most thing which we'll be doing while, uh, we're running our uh, firmware code on the board and it provides a soc.h header uh, which can be included by the board and driver uh, files and it can also contains a lot of kconfig files, linker def definitions and the device tree fixups. So these are the details uh, of while adding a new SOC. So if you see this is the structure of a new SOC inside this uh, Samsung XYZ we can see there is a cmakelist.txt there's kconfig, kconfig, defconfig, kconfig SOC. Similarly under CR5 we will have its own specific kconfig, cukmakelist, linker script, soc.c, soc.h. So the uh, if you see those uh, things are present here and uh, these are included in the board uh, files also in the config which can be found it here. Similarly, the DTSI things which are present for this uh, SOC are located at these locations. DTS ARM, Samsung XYZ, Samsung CR5 for CR5 for generic, it will be like path DTS, architecture, vendor, vendor SOC name, and then dot DTSI, whatever the uh, drive IST extension is. Yeah. So moving forward, uh, how to add the DTS file or what details to add in it? So basically device tree includes all the files which contain uh, main SOC details and the nodes related to the different drivers or the peripherals like IRQ controller, CPU information, or a PWM driver or a UART driver or a MCT driver, those things. And these GTI files are included in actual board DTS files. So there'll be a generic board DTS file and we need to include these GTSI files so as to get that information. And also DTSI files are reusable. Uh, it's not necessary that you always need to create a new DTSI files. You can also reuse an older DTSI file by just changing few things. As mentioned in the last slide, the location is DTS architecture vendor and the vendor SOC name dot DTSI. Uh, another feature of DTS is like, uh, as in kernel, we need to uh, store the DTB blob at some additional memory and we pass it during runtime. But here we actually, the DTS information is uh, uh, taken care during the compile time itself. And then it is made like a flattened device tree and the details are sent to the driver files. 
Uh, these com uh, compiled details files are actually ch uh, cross checked with the uh, YML bindings details present. And then the information is uh, placed in a header file actually, which is used by the driver files or any other uh, code files in the project. So this is a sample DTS uh, file. Like it's a very simple, like how you mentioned the CPU, how you mentioned the associate details. Like if you see here, the interrupt controller details are mentioned for a GIC. Similarly, CPU Cortex R5. So inside this uh, part, DTS, ARM, Samsung XYZ, we have two different DTS. We can have two different DTS for CR5 and for M0. Since we'll be using CR5, so during compile time, you need to mention this in the board file and accordingly it will be take, uh, compiled and the header file will be generated from here. Yeah, so the next thing is adding board. So this is like, we have already seen this SOC series, the DTS, uh, now we are seeing the board and later we will see the drivers. So this actually, this uh, board directory actually represents the actual application hardware. This is present at boards architecture board name. So for, if you see for our example, it's boards, ARM, Samsung, XYZ, and all the board specific init information or initialization information are present here. So anything which we need to pass related to board, if external peripherals or internal peripherals will be present on board. Even this board uh, file folder actually contains information from other driver and SOC folders, even DTSI. And it contains a dev config uh, file actually, which uh, we will use for building, which will take uh, uh, use the other files to during the build time. So if you see, this is the structure of boards. Uh, inside boards arm Samsung, we have board.c, we have cmakelist.txt, we have kconfig.board, kconfig.df config. Then we have Samsung CR5 dev config. We have Samsung CR5.dts, Samsung CR5.yml. So this DTS will include that DTSI file actually. And this dev config will have all the details related to which uh, modules to build during the compile time. And kconfig will also have that hardware configurations, what all we need to uh, insert into the associate details. And this YAML will be the one which will be using to cross check the uh, details, how the binding is happening via the details. So basically while compiling the fire image, we always refer board name, which includes all SOC DTSI related information. It also contains a .h files, which can be used by the drivers and the applications. Uh, and in the board.cmake, actually we instruct how to flash or debug the uh, code when we are, it's running on the board. And this includes the, that YAML file actually includes all the board details, which will be uh, verifying with the DTS files. So the next thing is adding uh, new drivers. So these are located at drivers folder inside that there can be driver type or directly a folder. So if it's uh, related to any specific protocol like serial DMA or USB that can be added inside, inside this subfolder or if it's any uh, uh, new uh, driver which doesn't have any specific protocol then it can be added directly after drivers. And the selection and configuration of these drivers are done via the con K configs and the device tree. Uh, if we present the nodes there in the device tree and then enable the same in the K configs and mention them in the K configs, then during the compile time, it will take this. And this initialization is performed during uh, the drivers initialization performed during the boot only. The similar way in what we do in the kernel after the system initialization, we go for different device driver initializations and then do the binding. Uh, YAML files are actually there, which describe the device tree nodes and properties. So you need to uh, define those properties or, uh, or mention those properties in your driver according to those YAML description only so that you don't face any issue with the uh, binding of device and driver. And then device tree file to define. So to the steps to add driver for compilation is like, uh, first you need to add the driver files. Then you need to have K config files for uh, uh, the details. You need to either add in the main K config files, or you need to add your own K config files, which can be included in the other K config files. So for a, a specific sub module driver, uh, you know, the hierarchy looks like that, that inside the drivers, there's a serial, there is file like cmakelist.txt, K config, K config.cr5. Here only the driver files will be actually there. So this is the steps to actually add driver to the init sequence. So we define a driver similar to whatever uh, compatible name we are mentioning in the device tree. And then we pass this uh, init uh, 
function to this uh, macro and it will do the add this uh, driver to the init sequence actually basically this is the hooking of uh, driver api to the zephyr framework yeah so this was the part till where like uh, what all uh, porting changes we need to do or hardware support implementation we need to do so the next topic is uh, debugging tips here we will see what are the basic debugging tips which we can use or i have used during my porting to um, uh, do it smoothly so uh, first of all the thing is like uh, we can check into the other source code reference to understand what exactly needs to be done to initialize soc like already there are support for different socs there in the zephyr so you can look into those codes and see what all changes are required and then try to print uh, in the uart actually while accessing registers or something so the basic thing is like once the core is up the first thing you need to do is implement the uart driver so that print k is there because print k is like a light for a firmware so that can help to debug it faster you can uh, turn on the system logging or logger that can help you to get the logs from the system side uh, you can as, uh, turn on the assets, uh, the config asset to try and catch the errors. And you can also use an on chip digger like Ultrasoc or JLink or ULink so that you can debug it better while running. You don't need an external debugger, you can uh, use an on chip debugger actually. So now we will look into the key tools and build commands. Uh, so for that uh, Zephyr build system use these important tools actually. So there is one called CMake which contains all the source code build steps. So it contains all the basic uh, build steps required for a source uh, source code. Then there is YAML. So these files provide information used mostly for documentation or help points. So basically all the uh, codes or all the details which we are adding, the information related to that as a document is present in this uh, YAML files. Then there is a command called vest which provides the build command which can be internally used by the cmake list uh, inside each sub directory and it will help to build each sub directory along with the main directory so this so this is how you will use the vest commands to build so if you see vest init does the init zephyr build then vest board uh, will list all the available boards and based on the available board you can use this command vest build minus b board name and samples hello world whatever file you are adding minus p to build this uh, zephyr os for a specific board yeah now we will look into the specific driver like the timer driver so basically timer is a kernel object that measures the passage of time so whenever you are uh, running soc you need to have a timer to uh, uh, which actually measures the passage of time so this is one of the uh, the driver like there can be multiple different uh, timers for ARM. It will it's an ARC timer. Then there is an MCT timer, WDT timer, PWM timer. And when a uh, timer specific time limit is reached, it can perform an application defined action or wait. So basically, different timers have different features. Some timers like have features like if you reach a specific time limit, it will do a reset or it will generate an interrupt which using which you can have an handler function to perform an any function. So basically, if you want any one feature which needs to be happen at certain point of time periodically, then you can have this timer feature in that actually. And any number of timers can be defined. It's not like only one timer you can have. And the timer has following key properties like duration is there, period is there, expiry function is there, stop function is there. If you see the implementation of a timer, if you see there is a defining a timer, how you define a timer. So basically it is defined using variable of type k type k type k timer. Uh, it can be initialized by calling k timer in it. Then you can use the timer expiry function to call a handler or something like that or call a callback function. Then there is another feature to read timer status. If you want to have some uh, like polling or that you can read timer status. And you can use a timer status synchronization also. So this was all about timers. The next thing is UART driver. So basically, as said earlier, UART driver is like a, it gives us print K, which is the life for our uh, SOC. So basically, this will demonstrate how to use the UART serial driver with a simple echo book. So basically, it uh, whatever data you uh, give to the console, it will read data and then it goes the uh, same data after the end of line is actually received. That is once you press the enter key. So the 
for sending data, polling API is used, and for receiving the interrupt driven API is used. So UART can function in both polling and interrupt mode. So for receiving, we are using interrupt, and for sending, we are using polling mode. By default, the UART peripheral is normally used for Zephyr shell, uh, like the UART peripheral is used by the Zephyr shell only, but uh, which has support for all board. But if you want to have a specific shell for your, you can implement that and use the UART peripheral. So this is how you build and run the UART. So this is where you are uh, building the UART module along with the board, and then we do West Flash. And once it comes, you can say that the print comes at hello, I am your eco board, tell me something and press enter. So now if you write there, hi there and press enter, the print will be like hi there. So this is the way you can use UART. If you want to access a SFR, you can have that feature also added here. Uh, so the last part of the uh, presentation is like what else we can do for the things in the future. So basically Zephyr is a framework for most of the generic drivers. But if you want to add any individual drivers, you, that needs to be explored how to add. If there's uh, like most of the generic drivers will have their own framework. But if you want to add a new type of a uh, generic driver, then also you need to have a core framework, then the associate specific drivers. That is one thing to look forward. Then more device tree can hold most of the IP uh, hardware details. And these can be read from drivers. Uh, but the thing is, these can actually not be needed and these can actually be given directly into the device driver. So that is one thing which we can look into that like, there are many bare metal code bases which use this feature of having the details directly to the device driver. So we can uh, look further into this so as to make Porting more easy, not much changes must be required in the device tree because a lot of things can be redundant in the device tree or it needs to be done according to some law. But if you don't have any information related to specific information, then you can ignore it using the device driver. So for that, we need to make the device driver itself compatible. And all the predefined linker scripts via TTSI file, which are already defined, can be modified and used. So normally, nowadays, when we try to port a uh, new SOC, we write a new linker scripts or DTSI file, but it can be there like there can be a generic DTSI file or a linker script which we can use with little modification so as to face less booting issues. Yeah, so this was the presentation for porting. So if you have any questions, you can actually ask.